Hello, comic creators. Welcome back to the Comics Connection podcast. This is where we talk about the things that you need to know about the business and creative side of being a professional comic creator on all levels of the business. My name is Kamal Hennessy. The gentleman sitting next to me virtually is Andy Schmidt. And this is our last podcast of 2023 because we're slackers. And after today, neither one of us are going to actually be in the office to do anything, including making podcasts. So, um, Andy, because the industry itself is kind of slowing down for the holidays as well, this is the probably the best time for us to talk about what we think is going to happen in 2024 in terms of big major shifts in the industry and give us a 100% chance to be wrong. So are you, are you ready? Always ready to be wrong, Gamal. Okay. Um, well, in thinking about what it is that we're going to, the four topics that we're going to actually touch on are basically what I think the continuation of like the evolutionary process of some of the major stories that happened in 2023 and how those things might actually play out in 2024 based on our informed and reasoned opinions that, again, will probably 100% not come true. Um, the first one is not a necessarily a good story. We're going to, I, I can easily see in 2024 a rise in censorship especially within the comic book medium in 2024. The reason I say this is because, A, there's been a significant spike in censorship over the last half decade, specifically with graphic novels, because they are easier for conservative groups to censor. And B, we are heading into an election year and in an attempt to gain more control over the news cycles and grab more headlines, it will be much easier instead of actually proposing, I don't know, policies and things like that to attempt to censor books. And I think comic books, as they have been for the past few years, are going to take the brunt of that, um, of those attacks. Um, depending on what it is you're doing in comics and where you are in comics, your response to potential censorship might be a little bit different. We talk a lot in Comics Connection about how censorship in some ways can be positive press, in other ways can actually decimate a title. But Andy, as a publisher who publishes, who could potentially be censored in any different state, do you feel like censorship is something that you are concerned about for 2024? I'm not that concerned about censorship in terms of, you know, a book of ours being banned um, anywhere, but I am a little bit concerned about, you know, putting out content that just gets used by someone with an agenda, mm -hmm. right, to, and put at the forefront and then gets lamb lambasted and, and like you were saying, sort of decimated or crushed you know probably unfairly because usually those people that are just looking for something to use usually aren't really doing any kind of real true analysis of the work they're just looking for something that they can pull out of it and go see here's a thing that we should all rail against and mm -hmm. and like you were saying like that can financially benefit a book if it gets enough coverage and there's like a backlash to the outrage mm -hmm. but if there's not a backlash to that outrage it couldn't it can just shutter the sales of a book so and i don't know that i mean you can sort of have uh strategies like generally in mind for what would i do if mm -hmm. but um but you can't really have a solid plan because you don't you never know what the specific attack is going to be when it's coming where it's coming from what the response is going to be so um it it is something i give some thought to um uh and hope i don't have to deal with just because the whole thing sounds super annoying um but it's definitely a possibility and it's a risk factor that 
to a very small degree, I think I probably am taking into consideration when looking at projects. Yeah, I think. But to a very small degree. Yeah, the most important part is the the idea that you brought up that you can't really predict the nature of what a censorship attack might look like for one of your books. So what I usually recommend from just a legal capacity is to make sure you have the contact information for organizations like the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, ACLU, um, Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, because they have experience with multiple different types of scenarios and they have systems in place that can actually help you so you're not feeling like this whole big political minded attack is you're doing it by yourself. There are organizations, there are systems in place that can help. And if you just know that those resources are out there, that can actually give you some comfort in kind of weathering that kind of storm. Moving on to a more to the more economic side of what I think is going to happen in 2024, I do believe from a crowdfunding standpoint, I think there's going to be a plateau. I think you're going to start to see because crowdfunding in terms of successful projects and independent and emerging publishers using crowdfunding to get their books out into the world and build up their business models, there's it's been highly successful for the past eight, 10 years. I think you're going to start to see a lot of that plateau where the people who understand how much work goes into it and how intricate it is and how much you have to nurture that crowd before you can get the funding, they're going to do fine. But there's, I think, a lot more creators coming into the system who just see crowdfunding as a quick way to make money and they do not understand the nature of the work that goes into it. So a lot of them are going to just jump into crowdfunding and they're not going to hit their goals and their projects are going to fail. And that's going to create more of a perception that crowdfunding is not as successful or is not as profitable as it used to be, when in reality, it's just people going into it who don't understand what it takes to actually make that successful. Now, Andy, you had two crowdfunding projects that were successful this year, and I had a crowdfunding project that was successful this year. But do you think that you're going to do more crowdfunding 2024? And do you think that there's there's going to be a, we've actually hit a, hit a place where people are getting into it without understanding what they're getting into. Um, I think, I mean, I think you're, I think you're right about we are, we're likely to hit a plateau. There are still going to be those outliers that do super well and, mm -hmm. and those that don't, that don't fund. But I think in large part, we're going to see kind of a, a, a plateau of things, but the other place where I think you're right, and hopefully we're not hundred percent wrong here is that, um, I think you are correct in that those people that go into it, just seeing it as a way to make money faster mm -hmm. or on the front end. And, and like, that's kind of all they're thinking about. They're not approaching the crowdfunding platforms with a long-term mindset. So like our projects that were crowd that were successful, that's great. But for me, that's just the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. That's just, you know, that's the start of trying to develop something and grow a business. And that will take years. Um, and I think that that development cycle, the ability to grow that business is going to slow down for most people mm -hmm. um, because of what you're saying. There's like, a, there's like sort of the saturation point that I think we're hitting. I mean, I'm already starting to see a bit of a sort of a slowdown, um, but um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree with you in terms of, of there being a plateau, but I, but I would, I would just, sort of remind folks that the flip side of that is that it is a very useful part part i think mm -hmm. of a of a business um maybe it can be the bulk of your business but but it's um yeah it's a very it's, it's very useful and the people that do it well do very well with it yeah i think there's also um just to cap on that idea rob salkowitz who writes for icv2 and for forbes put out a article today where he was talking about how 2023 was a big year for crowdfunding 
and not just for, like you said, that initial piece of the distribution cycle, but now crowdfunding is getting more integration with bookstore distribution, direct market distribution, so that a comic book or a graphic novel can actually have several release windows, very similar to a film where there's some money coming in on the front end through the crowdfunding and then a longer tail of revenue coming in through direct market distribution, bookstore distribution, direct to consumer distribution. So if, if creators actually position their comics, like you said, to be successful over the long term and crowdfunding is the first piece, then that's going to make a lot more sense for not just the individual comics, but for crowdfunding in general, because if you're, I think if you're trying to build a business just on crowdfunding, it's it's a much bigger ask because you're asking to have so much money coming in from one distribution channel as opposed to diversifying your channels and then bringing in, you know, a little bit of money from all of those channels to make a overall successful project. And since I actually mentioned direct market in in that segue, my third prediction is going to be a continuing evolution of the direct market. The last three or four months, we've had a lot of discussions, arguments, and um, pontification on both sides of the direct market kind of question. And I think in 2024, you will continue to see an evolution where shops that are purely focused on distributing monthly periodicals from the big two are going to continue to struggle and more of those shops are going to close. Whereas you will find other shops that are trying more innovative product lines, more innovative um, or progressive sales or business strategies coming in to try to fill that space and do better. Um, I think just because of the general economy and the struggles that brick and mortar are going to go through in general in the next few years, even shops that have an innovative strategy, it's going to be a big challenge. But the ones who kind of remain locked into that big two Wednesday warrior kind of thing are going to find it harder and harder to keep the doors open. Now, you have books in the direct market and you actually talk to a lot of comic shop owners. So how wrong is that concept? I don't know that it's wrong. I mean, it's it's generalized, right? I mean, I mean, we're we're kind of lumping retailers into two or three general groups, mm -hmm. right? And very few retailers fit like solely in, you know, or very solidly in one of those three buckets. But uh yeah, I mean, the conversations I'm having with retailers are what can we do to bring value? to your store right um uh and and you know what are your points of pain and how mm -hmm. can we help you know minimize or eliminate those um you know and i always go into those conversations and say you know i'm open to any conversation any discussion but it also has to work for for my business as well and i have responsibilities to staff and i have responsibility to the creators that get royalties um you know, I'm in sort of an interesting position in some places because we pay royalties on every single copy of a comic that we publish, um, that, that, that we sell. And, um, and most publishers do not do that. They recoup all of their expenses, the printing costs, the shipping costs, all that sort of stuff first. And then there's a profit split, you know, once they've sold a couple thousand units, mm -hmm. then they'll split the profit with the creators. Um, and because of the way that we do it, um, it means that there are certain things that we do because we're paying the creator, which I think is the right thing to be doing. Um, they're more expensive for us to do than for other publishers. And so to a certain degree, you know, usually it takes a real conversation with a retailer to understand that like, oh, your price is a little bit higher. And here's why. And once they get it, once they understand it, because most of these shops are into comics and they want to support the creators too. And once they realize that you're actually paying the creators, they, um, you know, the, there's a little bit more understanding in that conversation. Now we may try and find a deal that works for them or whatever, but, um, but yeah, that's, 
you know, so there, there are places where trying to be, you know, a good, good actor in this industry, you know, can be, can make things more challenging, but hopefully in the long run, it'll be worth it because hopefully learning things like that, you know, retailers want to support our books a little bit, a little bit more, but it's like one conversation at a time. So it's a, it's a, it's a very long thing, but my point being that the retailers are, I have not yet talked to a retailer that's not open to new ideas. Mm. Um, it's just how those new ideas fit with their perception of their customers, you know, varies from store to store. Um, mm. So it's, it's really interesting, but yeah, when I pull back, I mean, the, the overall problem seems to be that, you know, there, there is a sense, there's, there's a lot of anger among certain parts of retailers and, and uh, certain retailers and I get it. it usually, usually it's the retailers that have been in the business for a long time for, de- for a couple decades or more. Mm-hmm. And I think though, I haven't heard anybody actually verbalize this. I think there's a sense of betrayal because the idea of the direct market was we buy the books on a non-returnable basis mm-hmm. and we get them early and we get books that nobody else gets. Mm-hmm. And that's been disrupted partially due to crowdfunding, which we were just talking about, because now publishers and are going direct to the consumer before the retailer even gets it. And they might be getting a version the retailer is not allowed to get. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there are all these, there are all these other methods that people are getting content. And so the stores are losing a lot of that value, but they're still being asked to, to buy under the exact same terms as before. So I, I get where, why there's angst and anger and, and um and uh yeah some outrage and i don't i don't think it's completely misguided uh, by any means mm. but how that's going to play out in 2024 i don't know but what you said generally sounds right all businesses do have to adapt that's been true of of the businesses that have been you know you know uh big two warriors uh for decades they have been adapting they just may have to adapt more and potentially faster mm-hmm. than they have in the past mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but yeah, hopefully man. they won't go away because we still need them absolutely <laughs> and their customers still want them so um absolutely. but so the yeah other, i mean it, the other know. thing even if you take out the the kind of shifts in the market that the direct market specifically hasn't been that sense of betrayal that you said that they they feel because the the rules of the game have been changing on them they still have to deal with the kind of larger brick and mortar economic stress that is imposed yeah. by things like you know buying things online and getting you know publishers selling stuff directly from their website and bypassing the direct market altogether and one thing that they direct market has been concerned about, which up to now has not necessarily been a real problem, is digital comics, which I believe is going to be the last major thing that I think is going to shift in 2024. And I believe one of the, I guess I'll call them the successors to comicsology, will actually position themselves to take a a firmer control of that of the digital space and put themselves in a position where they can at this in this way that's similar to webtoon start to generate a business model that actually generates real profit to the point where publishers and creators see digital not necessarily just as a marketing vehicle but as a way a solid distribution channel to put out their stuff I don't know if it's going to be Omnibus or Global Comics or Distillery or the three or four other um, platforms that have put themselves out into the market, but I do think the collapse of comicsology has created a opportunity for digital to kind of restart itself, digital comics to restart itself, and 2024 is going to be the year that one of those players kind of figures out the formula and starts to make moves in that direction. I agree with all of that. I will say that I think the 
biggest issue right now, um, and I just had this conversation with a with a brick and mortar retailer the other day too, is that a lot of that digital competition is coming from the big two, right? Mm -hmm. Marvel and DC both have their own subscription service. So if you want to read all the Marvel books you want or all the DC books you want, you can do that on your iPad or your your Kindle Fire or whatever the whatever whatever device you have that you read can, can read comics on. Um, it's all available for Marvel and DC. Um, it's probably true for some of the other companies. I think it's true for a few of the other American publishers. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly things like Webtoons that are consumed largely digitally, um, it, it, it becomes bigger competition for the stores, but it's also a problem for those digital platforms because there's no real reason at this point that, that I see for Marvel or DC, the two largest players in North American comics, to join one of those platforms, mm -hmm. right? So the the thing that Comixology had that I, I I don't know how anybody else could get is that they had Marvel and DC both on their platform. And then when everybody else joined up there, Marvel and DC were, were this giant maw at the top of the funnel. Mm -hmm. And then you get those people that would kind of splinter off and try other things. Whereas, you know, at first glance, it sort of seems like, well, you know, you just have all those small publishers under one banner and people would come to those except that Marvel and DC are often a gateway to even discovering those. Um, again, that's not so much an issue for manga or webtoons, but uh, but for the American style comics, it, it is. And I don't know how any of these companies would overcome that. Perhaps just by cutting a very large check. I don't know. Like you know, I noticed on Netflix the other day that a bunch of of uh, the, you know the DC movies are now on Netflix. Well, prior to that, they'd all been on. Um, Mm -hmm. Max, Max only, which is the Warner Brothers platform. So that's not that dissimilar, right? Like mm -hmm. that's Netflix going, hey, we'd like to carry them too. And presumably Netflix was like, here's a big enough check to make it worth your time. They're like, okay. So, um, you know, it, it may take something like that, but I, I think that's the, that's the sort of the biggest obstacle to all of them, mm -hmm. right? They all have their different business models and, and whatnot. And, um, uh, but yeah, that's the biggest obstacle I see to all of them. Yeah, I think, I think there's there is something to be said for bringing in a a big enough reason, a funnel, or a a reason to justify people starting with the app in the first place. When we talk about it in Comics Connection, and we have the analogy, the analogy is always nobody signs up for Netflix because they want Netflix. They want a specific show that they cannot see anywhere else unless they get Netflix. And then they watch all the other stuff that happens to be there. And with the digital comics platforms at the moment, especially if you're not talking about webtoons, is that most of them have most of the stuff. So there is no reason, and in many cases, a lot of it is either the same price as print or it's going to be, to a certain extent, it's going to be free or it's going to be subscription. But if there's no one reason to get on that platform, you're not going to necessarily have anybody on that platform. Um, so, yeah, signing to get exclusive content may be a way to actually drive more more readers to the exclusives and then people like you said will check out other things later but until you get to that point and until you get to a point where people are willing to actually pay whether it's subscription or whether it's they switch to a more advertising based model where people can see stuff for free like youtube but they pay with their attention those are models that are working for webtoon i don't know if other publishers will pick them up but now that we've actually talked about censorship and crowdfunding and the direct market and digital, I can almost guarantee that everything that we talked about will not happen and it'll be something completely different. So yeah, not one, not one little bit, yeah. not one little bit. You, if you got to this point in the podcast, giant waste of your time. <laughs> well, even though it may have actually been a giant waste of your time, I appreciate and Andy appreciates the fact that, you um, spend time with us in this podcast listening to what's going on in the comic book industry for 2023. We will be back in 2024 
if you would like to check out the other things that we talk about in Comics Connection, there will be a link in the show notes for you to get a two-month free trial for the Comics Connection membership. And until then, we will see you guys in 2024. Andy, thank you as always. I'm Gamal. We will see you next time. Have fun with your comics.